سلام به همگی دوستان امیدوارم حالتون خوب باشه به برنامه اینان گل سرخ خوش اومدید من مریم نمازی هم و فری برز پویا هستم و خیلی خوشحالم که به برنامه اینان گل سرخ برگشتم ما خیلی خوشحالیم که شما برگشتین نگران بودیم مدتی رفته بودیم مثل اینکه توی کوها که ده فرمان برامون بیارید البته 15 فرمان بود ولی 10 تاش افتاد دستم از پنج تاش افتاد 10 تاش موند ولی 10 تاش هم زیادی مونه آره خیلی فکر کنم زیاده در برنامه این هفته مصاحبه ای داریم با گلایلا اسماعیل از پاکستان در رابطه با دختران آگاه در زم در رابطه با قانون جدید ترکیه در رابطه تجاوز دختران جوان در مورد یک نقش طرح اسلامی ها در مونترال برای منطقه مسلمان نشین ثبت قانون علیه اسلام هراسی در پارلمان کانادا این خبر خیلی بدیه محاصره مردم در منطقه موسل بین داعش و جریانات شیعه فتوه احمقانه در رابطه با چطوری باید شلوار رو پوشاند که خدا ناراحت نشه خدا ناراحت نشه این خیلی مهمه زندگی سخته خیلی اونجا سخته. و لحظه زیبای زندگی در رابطه یک پسر جوونیه که داره با هنر علیه داعش می جنگه با ما باشید جایی نرید در اخبار این هفته اومده بود که در پارلمان ترکیه یک لایحه مورد بررسیه که تجاوز و داشتن رابطه جنسی با کودکان و دختران زیر 15 ساله رو در صورتی که متجاوز باشون ازدواج بکنه قانونی اعلام میکنه و مورد تعقیب قرار نمیگن و این واقعا شنی ترین برگ در سنت جنت اسلام سیاسی و اتفاقا قبلا قانونی وجود داشت در ترکیه که هر نوع رابطه جنسی با دختر زیر 15 سال قدنقم بود جنایی محسوب می شد ولی الان اونو برداشتن از قوانینشون الان هم میگن اگر که یک کسی به دختر 15 ساله و زیر تجاوز کنه میتونه باش ازدواج کنه و کاملا قانونیه خیلی جالب این از سطر اسلام این قضیه تجاوز به کودکان بوده امروز میبینیم توی سعی میکنن قانونیش بکنن هر جوشن تو عربستان سوریه داعش و توی جمهوری اسلامی توی پارلمان جمهوری اسلامی هم این کارو این در واقع این لایحه مشابهی رو مورد بررسی قرار دادن و خب توی, توی خود ترکیه جامعه ترکیه واقعا اعتراضات خیلی وسیع بوده در سطح جهان هم همینطور و مشخصه که این جنبش ماست جنبشیه که ما باید صد در صد بدون هیچ غیر و شرط ازش دفاع کنیم و واقعا نذاریم که اردوغان و اسلامیا این چنین عقبگرد بیارن به اون جامعه و به خصوص حق و حقوقی که کودکان داشتن دقیقا تو ایران همونطور که اون لایه رو جمهوری اسلامی مجبور شد عقب نشینه بکنه باید با مردم ترکیه هم همبستگی اعلام بشه از پشتیبان بشه که اردوغان نتونه این بلا رو سر مردم ترکیه بره این یه واقعا وقتی نگاه میکنیم به نوعی که اسلامیا میان و واقعا مثل نمیدونم اکتوپوس اکتوپوس میان همه بخشای جامعه رو تحت تاثیر میذارن زندگی مردم رو سیاه میکنن از اون ور تو ترکیه توی مانتریال کانادا الان خبر اومده که یه کسی هست که الان داره یه طرحی افرده که گفته که مناطق فقط مسلمون نشین میخواد خیلی جالبه اومده این, این،, این کاری کرده گفته که تا جایی که من خبرش رو شنیدم اینه که گفته که خب مسلمان ها نمیخوان بهره بانکی بدن و غیر قانونی توی حلال نیست توی اسلام به این خاطر سعی کرد اینطوری به شکل نرم در واقع بیاد این طرح منطقه مسلمان ها رو که آدم ها نگاه میکنن خب آدم ها نمیخوان میخوان بر مبنای زندگی و طریقت زندگی خودشون چیز کنن ولی وقتی مورد سوال قرار دادن گفتن خب کسایی دیگه هم میتونن بیان اینجا زندگی کنن قوانین چیزی معلومه میتونن گفته ولی خب بعد مثلا مراقب لباس زنا نباید هر طوری که میخوان لباس بپوشن مشروب نباید بخورن این دیگه منطقه ای که باید رعایت بشه و خب مشخص دقیقا قوانین اسلامی باید رعایت بشه دقیقا همون کاری رو که میخوان توی در واقع توی کشورهای خاورمیانه و شمال آفریقا تلاش کردن الهاز قانونی کار میکنن سعی میکنن اینا مناطق و بخشایی رو به وجود بیارن که همون قوانین رو اجرا بکنن و مورد اعتراض شدید مردم قرار گرفت توی کانادا خب یه،, یه چیزی که واقعا دولت کانادا کمک کرده به این نوع رشد این نوع دیدگاه و 
رشد اسلام سیاسی تو اون کشور الان اخیرا خبر اومده که پارلمان کانادا قانون ضد اسلام حراسی رو تصفیب کرده و به این معنی که نه فقط حمله به مردم مسلمان خب مشخص اون به هیچ وجه غیر قابل قبول نیست ولی اینو قاطی کرده با انتقاد از اسلام و انتقاد از اسلام سیاسی از جنت اسلام سیاسی توی کانادا دیگه نمیشه انتقاد کرد ظاهرا نمیشه نقد کرد که مثلا بگی اسلام یه دین مرتجع است اسلام قوانین نابرابری بین زن و مرد داره به خاطر اینکه میشه اسلام حراسی و در واقع جنت اسلامی این کارو میکنن میان از یه موضوعی رو که فرض کن به تحنام مردم مسلمان تحت شرایطی قرار گرفتن یا فشار بهش میاد از اون بعد میدن استفاده میکنن سیاست خودشون رو که در واقع نمیخوان کسی بهش انتقاد بکنه به جنات راست اسلامی به جنات فاشیست اسلامی سعی میکنن این قانون بدن و این اولین جایی که من دیدم که به شکل رسمی توی کانادا تو آمریکا و اروپا این قانون رو بردن و این قانون بعد به یک موضوع خیلی مهمی که یه لکه ننگی بر سیاست و قانون اساسی و آزادی کاندا. بیان آزادی عقیده به خاطر اینکه الان چیزی که میبینیم این که دقیقا این, این قوانین ارتداد و توهین به مقدساتی که توی ایران و عربستان سعودی دارن الان از طریق اسلام حراسی دارن سعی میکنن روی جامعه رو سعی کنند که خفه بکنم دقیقا, دقیقا. 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 و خب قبل از اینکه این بخش رو تموم کنیم دوست داریم خبری که از سوی فدراسیون سراسری پناهندگان عراق به ما رسیده رو بهتون بگیم که و این اونیه که پنج هزار تا شهروند در یک منطقه مصل به اسم الخازر اونا بین نیروهای داعش و نیروهای مسلح شیعه الان گیر افتادن و واقعا جونشون در خطره دقیقا اینطوریه اکثر همه مردم محصول در واقع بین جریانات گیر افتادن ولی به طور مشخص یه بخشی رو که جنت حوادار جمهوری اسلامی این شیعه های فاشیستی رو که اونجا در واقع جمهوری اسلامی و دولت عراق تربیت کرده اومدن اون منطقه اجازه نمیدن مردم در برن از اون طرف هم جنات داعش مردم رو به عنوان سپر جنگی داره ازشون استفاده میکنه و سازمان پناهندگان سراسری پناهندگان عراق از همه مردم دنیا خواسته که صدای اعتراض خودشون رو به این وضعیت بلند بکنن و خواستار این بشن که مردم بیگناه محصول این وسط بین نیروهایی که دارن درگیر جنگ هست نجات پیدا بکنن چند هفته پیش با گلله اسماعیل تونستم مصاحبه داشته باشم وقتی در کنفرانس زنان در سکولاریسم بودم در واشنگتن دی سی و واقعا وقتی که صحبت های این دختر جوان آدم میشنوه از 16 سالگی یه سازمانی شروع کرده در دفاع از حقوق زنان از حقوق دختران و جالب اینجاست که منطقه در پاکستان این سازمان رو شروع کرد که طالبان درش قدرت داره و این دادگاه های واقعا ارتجای قومی مذهبی که اونجا همیشه دارن علیه زنان واقعا قوانین خیلی ضد زنی رو دارن مطرح میکنن ولی خب چیزی که جالبه خود گلالان میگه که تاریخا اون منطقه منطقه مهمی بود برای مبارزه مبارزه علیه خشونت دقیقاً و, و یکی از دقیقاً یکی از خصوصیات این مصاحبه رو که میتونیم ببینیم و نشون دهنده خیلی از این جریانات و جنبش هایی که وجود داره در جنات کشورهای اسلام زده اینه که به مقدار خیلی زیادی از پایین شکل گرفتن خود سازماندهی توش خیلی زیاده خود آگاهی توش خیلی زیاده و اینو میشه کاملا توی این دید و این یکی از نوع جدید سازماندهی امروز در دنیای امروز به علیه جنت اسلامی و اسلام سیاسی و مذهبی اون خود سازماندهی و این یکی از خصوصیات این جنبش و به نظرم ارزشمند بعد پشتیبانی قرار مورد پشتیبانی قرار بگیره ولی این مورد که خواستم بگم اینجاست که اضافه میدونم وقتم که مریم اینه که ما همیشه اینو گفتیم توی برنامه نانه گرسوخ که در پاکستان یک جنبش قویه 
زنان بر علیه جنت اسلام سیاسی وجود داره و شایسته پشتیبانی زیادی هستند و این باید به رسمیت شناخته بشه را حتما این مصاحبه رو با ما ببینید واقعا به نظرم خیلی براتون جالب خواهد بود که یک دختر 16 ساله با خواهرش چه کارهایی در پاکستان کرده در, در حالی که واقعا با خطرات واقعا جدی هم مواجه بوده تونسته واقعا وضعیت رو به نفع دختران و زنان تغییر بده با ما باشید جایی نرید I wanted to speak to you about Girls Aware, something you started at the age of 16. How did you go about doing that and why? Um, when, like, growing up in a culture which is uh, which treats women and girls differently, and growing up very at a very young age, I realized that I'm treated differently from boys in in my in my home in my surrounding. By like, my brothers could go outside; they could play cricket. I couldn't go outside. I was supposed to stay inside. I was supposed to cover my myself. My body was a matter of shame for for me, for my family, and kind of like being girl was something associated with shame. So it kind of like, that, that was very disturbing for me. And then at the same time, uh, I would also hear a lot from my cousins that how privileged we are because we are going to school. And I couldn't understand that because at that time I was like being a girl when you live in a society which treats you as a matter of shame and then you hear that you are privileged I couldn't get it but then uh, one of my cousin who was almost my age and she was taken out of school so that she could be married to a man who was 10 years older than her and this cousin of mine she wanted to become a pilot so it was very uh, shocking for me like it shattered it, it shocked me to see her dreams shattered and that was a point when I realized that yes my right to education was actually not a right it was a privilege I was going to school because I was in a privileged family which thought girls should go to, to education and it was not the same for all girls in my community so that was the incident and that was a point when I wanted I, I didn't want anyone else to go through same I didn't any I didn't want any other girl not being able to follow her dreams and not being able to do what she wants to do so I decided with my sister that we need to do something about it we need to change it so what we did we started talking to other girls in our neighborhood we started talking to uh, girls in my uh, in our schools and we soon realized that many girls have actually internalized the discriminations and the patriarchy it's kind of defense mechanism for them they start believing that yes it's okay that's normal so we thought that if we want to bring change and if we want to change it then the first thing we have to do that we have to talk with girls we have to tell them that they are equal human beings they are full human beings and because they are full complete human beings they have full human rights so that's how we started because we realized that girls have internalized it and we wanted to start it with girls so we started a campaign to raise awareness among girls about their rights so that's how we started it and now we have a number of programs which make about political empowerment of young women about making sure that young women have spaces in the political spheres their voices of are heard they have decision making positions within the political parties and and that and also that the community actually supports them. Them. So we also work a lot with the community. We also work on countering violent extremism among young people and preventing them from religious extremism. And that uh, we we started our work on uh, countering violent extremism because that is also that that's a lot linked to um, to me as a person. Because when I was growing up, I grew up in a society where I learned that jihad is okay, and this is duty of every Muslim to go for jihad, either to Kashmir or Afghanistan. That was taught to me on media. On media, we would hear that how Muslims are getting oppressed all over the world, and being a Muslim, it is our responsibility to go and fight for them. I was learning in my school that how non-Muslims are bad people, Hindus are bad guys, they are bad people and therefore we are living in a separate country and I was also learning it like from the, hearing it from the mosque, hear, hearing it on the media so and then also we had um, people in our family who were going to jihad for Kashmir and Afghanistan and they were very celebrated, they were celebrated figures for being, for going to jihad and then, uh, then, then we would see recruitment of jihad on walls in our village so I grew up in a culture where where jihad was a very celebrated idea. So I also wanted to go for jihad. 
and but, but my father was a very different person he didn't he was a champion of nonviolence and he always criticized uh, policies of supporting militancy and war and he had suffered a lot for that and to give us education he would uh, actually um, he would make sure that we meet with people so that we can get different perspectives and in those in one of those meetings i met with a mother whose 13 year old son was who was like who would go to madrasa to read quran not for any militancy training he was just going there to read quran but he was brainwashed there and he was told that how like i was told he was told in the madrasa that jihad is the duty of every muslim we have to do it and we don't need permission of parents for that so this boy went to jihad without the permission of the mother and the mother said that she was so like imagine a son gets disappeared she was so desperate and then after a few months she received dead body of the son so that pain of of a mother uh, looking at her that how she lost her young son to jihad that was like again it changed something in me and i was like no this is not what i wanted to do yes the, no muslims should should be under oppression no one should uh, sh should face violence in their lives but this is not what i want to do i i don't want people as 13 to to get killed and that was in the moment that when i wanted to prevent other young persons from going to these militant organizations and then i was uh, i was lucky that i got mentorship uh, my father connected me to different women secular women activists actually who mentored me and who helped me unlearn my own uh, violent perspectives so they helped me unlearn my own uh, stereotypes and things i had and, and they helped me learn a new alternative perspective about nonviolent pluralism and then we started working with young people uh, by establishing a youth peace network which helps young people to prevent them from joining militant organizations and also with partnership of young people we promote an alternative narrative of non-violence coexistence and pluralism because we believe that pluralism and coexistence is something that it takes out oxygen from militancy takes out oxygen from fundamentalism so we are promoting these alternative narratives to have societies which are more just more peaceful and non Violent. And also, I mean, when you talk, uh, you're also doing it in under conditions that are very difficult. I mean, the northwest uh, uh, area of Pakistan is one of the most difficult areas to live as a woman, as someone who believes in nonviolence. Uh, you know. How have you managed to do that? It's kind of it's very tricky. North West Frontier Province of Pakistan was a province which had actually on the lead of non-violent movement during the partition of India and uh, during struggle of freedom from the uh, from the British when we were colonized. So this was a land of non-violence, and uh, we had this uh, budget. His the, we had a non leader of non-violence. He was friend of Gandhi, and Gandhi had said that he had learned non-violence from Bajaj Khan. he is also known as, known as frontier gandhi and there were like thousands and millions of people who had actually joined movement of non violence so northwest of province of pakistan which today is known to the world for being a very conservative and violent place was actually land of non violence but what has happened that in our books they don't teach us history they don't teach us our non violent heroes in our books they only teach us war heroes and the people who were leaders of non violent they are taught to us as traitors so one of the thing we are doing in our work is that linking young people back to the non violent history reminding them that how we were the champions of non violence and how we can change things with non violence and we we give them these uh, and we we give them these non violent uh, um, leaders as the role models so they get to know these role models and because we have a long history of non violence it helps me a lot in my my work because they can relate to it because they were pashtuns they were from the northwest of pakistan their grandfathers were part of the movement like it's not very old their own grandfathers were part of those movements so it's very easy for them to link back to their history and to link back that yes how actually it's possible to uh, to live in a society which is non violence and coexistence Yes, today, and uh, it's also true that it's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult today because history has been manipulated. Uh, uh, syllabus was changes uh, was changed, curriculum was changed, and a lot of violence and hatred has been taught to the young people through books, through media, through mosques. So now uh, it is difficult, um, but we do. Uh, but but we do it. through number one peer education we have learned that peer education has a lot because when young people approach young people and other young people they tend to engage in dialogue 
easily and they are more kind of open and receptive to dialogues so we engaged we use peer education as a tool number two we we make these young people feel significant uh, because when they engage in the youth peace network and they uh, they develop their own initiatives to counter violent extremism we support their initiatives we mentor them so and when they achieve something in their community for example if they're able to prevent one young person from joining a militant organization or when, when they are able to take out one young child from militant madrasa and admit them in a public school they feel very significant in their community they feel yes they can change their community and it also helps them resolve their identity crisis which has been f uh, falsely created by the uh, militant networks so it uh, kind of like they feel like being a peace activist and being someone who can actually bring change in the community and uh, we pro we also uh, make sure that we give opportunities to young people where they can uh, talk to people who they see as the other as the different by doing interface dialogues and when they engage in interfaith dialogues when they start talking to people this they, they start understanding that the people whom they think that they were others are enemies are actually just common human beings like us and kind of like we we don't need to objectify them so it also helps a lot of young people to unlearn the hate and violence they have learned from media and schools and everywhere as a final question um, that region though even is, is also very difficult for women and girls, isn't it? It's, it's where you hear the Taliban has um, quite a lot of power. Uh, there are these tribal courts we often hear about. So how has that, uh, what has, how has that impacted on your work and how have you been able to challenge it given that context? When I started my work and like we would do any, uh, let's say like any event, like once we were doing, uh, when, once we were celebrating International Women's Day, so we were having an event and we invited different civil society organizations, activists and different people in the event. And like we were there on the stage and like waiting for people to come. And then everyone would come and tell us who is doing this event, like who is the leader of the event. Uh, and we'd tell, ah, we are doing it. And like, we are the leaders. And they're like, no, no, like who is the actual one who is doing the event? And we're like, we are the actual ones. They're like, oh no, I mean like, who is actually behind it? And like, we are the one who are behind it. And it was like, but you are girls yes girls can do it so you know it was like initially it was very difficult for the people to even accept the idea and to that girls can do it but you know slowly they became uh, kind of like accustomed to it and then i remember that when when once we were doing a peace training with young people and like we have all girls team in our office and we do everything by our own selves like even if it's like organizing chairs usually these things are supposed to be duties of men in our culture but we do it by ourselves like we will uh, paste banners on the walls and we would ready charts and everything so our young persons have given us feedback that the one they would come they would expect these boys would expect that now we will call them to help us to you know pick the tables and pictures but we never did that and then they were like for them it changed something when they see that oh actually these girls are doing it and they're not asking us for help and if they can do things we can do things so it kind of like when they get exposure to girls leaders initially it's a very different idea for them but then kind of like gradually they become accustomed to it and they realize that it's normal and if girls can do it if girls can counter violent extremism in such difficult circumstances why can't kind of they're like why can't we we can also do it so uh, it's a, it's an amazing experience it's also a difficult experience it's always uh, spaces for civil societies are shrinking, not just in Pakistan, all over the world. Spaces are shrinking. Now we have more repressive laws which uh, restricts uh, people from freedom of expression. Like recently a cybercrime uh, law has been passed which will make it very difficult to, uh, to express ourselves. Like just a few days back, a 16-year boy has been charged uh, for blasphemy because he liked a picture on Facebook. So it's like getting very repressive it's becoming very uh, difficult uh, we we know many uh, um, there are many amazing secular women in pakistan but all of them like they none of them are celebrated they face a lot of hatred from the society they face a lot of violence from the society i have been labeled as atheist because i'm working something which is different which challenges the culture which challenges the establishment so i have been and if in pakistan you are labeled as atheist it means anyone can just kill you that I have been labeled as an agent of the West, as an agent of CIA for the work I'm doing. I have been labeled as uh, someone who is destroying the culture of Pakistan, who is destroying the local culture, 
just because I'm speaking about rights. So it, it's life threatening at times. So there are some kind of like, we are able to change a lot minds of a lot of people, but at the same time, it's very life threatening. Two years back, our family was attacked and we had to relocate. Just last week, like 10 days ago, again my family was attacked. So it's kind of like our survival just depend on chance. If you live there and you counter uh, extremism, if you counter the status quo, if you counter patriarchy, then your survival depends on chance. It's really a matter of chance that you survive or you got killed. It's amazing that your family stood with you and by you. Um, yeah, my family is very supportive because uh, my father is a human rights activist. He has suffered at the hands of patriarchy, at the hands of uh, militancy. Uh, he's a victim and a survivor. Um, my, my mother is a victim and a survivor, so they made sure that they make a family a home uh, which is like coexistence and in our home you can be extremely religious or you can be extremely irreligious and we survive together, we live together, and it's totally fine. And uh, my own father was actually uh, charged for blasphemy in late 1990s when he criticized policy of the state for supporting militancy. He criticized that Pakistan should not be part of any uh, militancy initiatives. And for that, he was charged for blasphemy. Like, it was blasphemous. And then, luckily or unluckily, 9-11 happened, and definitions changed in the world, and jihad became terrorism all over the world. So that, uh, I think it was just because of that in, that incident that my father actually could be free and he wasn't punished for uh, criticizing the policies. Thank you very much. It was brilliant, brilliant hearing from you. Thank you very much. این هفته از یک ملایی که ظاهرا یه خط مستقیم با خداوند داره چون اینا تا اما میزن سرشون زود خط پیدا میکنن با هم یه فری لاین برودبند مستقیم به خدا پیدا میکنن ایشون گفته که شلوار که میخوایم بکنی آداب و رسوم داره همینطوری نمیتونی شلوار بکنی پاتون معلومه نه باید رو به قبله باشه باید سر هم نباشه وگرنه درد میگیری ناراحت خدا ناراحت میشه باید بخوابین برعکس از اون بعد چیز بکنین ولی خب ما امتحان کردیم نه دردی گرفتیم نه هیچ چی. ولی ما نمیدونم شرایطمون خیلی علمی بود دقیقاً علمی علمی بود از از ایشون هم علمی تر یعنی رو به قبله نبود از اون بر بود <تصفح> لایتینگش خوب بود این اینا دیوانه هستن یعنی مشخصه که واقعا دیگه انقدر قانون دارن برای کنترل مردم که دیگه گفتن خب پس ببینیم حالا چجوری بهشون بگیم شلوارشون رو پاش کنن آره فکر کنم بهتره به خود این طرف گوش بکنیم بیریم این دیوانه زنجیری چی میگه <تصفيق> پوشیدن شلوار به سمت قبله مکروه شما میدانید که اولا دستور داریم در آداب لباس همودن شلوارش انسان میخواد بپوشه بنشینه بپوشه استاده شلوار نپوشید در روایت داره اگر کسی ایستاده شلوارش رو بپوشه خدای متعال به درد او رو گرفتار میکنه که درمان نداشته باشه لحظه زیبای زندگی این هفته از یک جوان آسوریه که در مقابل چکش و نابودی داعش که تا آمده آثار باستانی و خنری عراق و سوریه رو نابود کرده شروع کرده قالب ریخته و از روی اکسای اینا اونا رو داره باستازی میکنه و یاد جوانای دیگه هم داره میده و چیزی که میگه اینه که من دارم علیه داعش با هنر میجنگم و واقعا نشوندهنده انسانیت و هنر چقدر میتونه آدم رو زنده کنه چقدر میتونه امیدوار کننده باشه در مقابل واقعا سیاهی و خرابی داعش و مذهب مذهب تعالی به انسان نمیده هنر فکر آزاداندیشی به انسان تعالی میده و این جوان نماینده 
انسانیته دوست داریم یه ویدیو کوتاه از این جوان و کاراش براتون نشون بدیم و با برنامه رو با اون تموم کنیم امیدوارم که از این برنامه خوشتون اومده باشه امیدوارم خوشحالین که فایورز برگشته من میدونم من خودم خیلی خیلی خوشحالم افتخار بنده است من خیلی خوشحالم واقعا سخت بود بدون ایشون و امیدوارم دیگه برنران توی کوه ها و رهنمود برامون بیارن و غیره و تا هفته آینده امیدوارم هفته خیلی خوبی داشته باشین تا بعد گربای Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.